Tonight, Wendy and John Patton are with us. They're two little girls, Jessica and Julia, are also here, not in the service. I believe they went to Awana, it sounds like where they went. Um, Wendy is a Stiles, who is Tom Stiles. Of course, many of you in the church know Tom. And Tom, um, Wendy is Tom's daughter. And Wendy went to Japan as a missionary, as a single missionary. And I think, did I get it right, 17 years you were there? Roughly 17 years, she was a single missionary in Japan. And I still haven't quite figured this part out, but so then John was a missionary in Spain. Now, <clears throat> I don't stare at maps very much, but Spain and Japan, there's some kind of distance between them, okay? So something happened, and they fell in love, and she left Japan and moved to Spain, and they have been um, in Spain, is it 10 years together? Okay, two terms, and uh, they have just come off the field from Spain, and now they are heading back, they're heading to Peru to minister to the people there. John was born in Peru, okay? So he has been working as a missionary in Spain and doing the work of God, and now he feels led of God to go back to Peru and begin ministering uh, is it with your brother? Is that what I understood? With his brother in Peru. So it's a kind of a pretty cool story. It's uh, one that he obviously can tell better than I can tell. So I've asked him to come. He's going to show a video. His wife is going to give a testimony. He's going to speak. He's op going to open up the Bible. So John, why don't you come and, and speak, a, speak to us tonight, brother? Thanks. Well, I wanted to thank Pastor and many of you other people that made us feel welcome. It's great to get into church and people know your name. And I just wanted to thank Pastor. In fact, before I even walked in the building, he said hi. And uh, he hosted us there, sat with us for supper. I wanted to thank those who were involved in the meal. We really enjoyed that. And uh, good to be back here in New York. Uh, my dad's from New York State, not from this area, from the Binghamton area. But it's great to be back. Uh, I know sometimes, especially in the summertime or the springtime, we drive uh, here to New York. And of course, the, the snow will do that, but I can just smell it in the air. I'm in New York. It's great to be back. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for your faithful prayers and support for us all these years. Um, as most of you know, that we've, we're in, in the middle of a transition. We finished our ministry in Spain, and they're transitioning to uh, work in the country of Peru, South America. We prayed about this uh, decision. We discussed the issues and we asked for uh, wise and uh, godly counsel. We didn't take this uh, decision lightly. We have a video presentation that we would like to share with you that explains how God has brought us to this point. We'll introduce you to the country of Peru and it also will describe our future ministry there. I was born in Iquitos, Peru to missionary parents Fred and Rachel Patton and spoke Spanish before I spoke English. I became a teacher and married Ruth Vandermeer in 1988. I grew up in a pastor's family living in Michigan and New York, then went to Japan as a short-term missionary after college in 1993. The next summer at ABW's candidate classes, I was appointed to Japan and John and Ruth Patton were appointed to Spain for career service. We served in our respective fields for many years. In 2005, Ruth was diagnosed with cancer. She lost an almost three-year battle and was promoted to heaven in 2008. I thought about changing fields at that difficult time. However, I decided to remain in Spain to be a good testimony to the believers there. In 2009, John and I began corresponding via email and visits to Japan and to Spain. We were married in 2010 and I moved to serve with John in Spain. Julia and Jessica, now six and five, were born in our first term together. After furlough in 2016, we moved to a different area of Madrid to start a new church plant. 
For a long time, I have had a desire to minister and prove, but did not feel called there during the 1994 candidate classes. Last year, we helped in the teaching and preaching ministries in a Latin American church in Madrid. We felt comfortable there and enjoyed working with Peruvian pastor Marco and his wife, Silvia. This experience increased my desire to return to Peru to work with Peruvians. As a new wife, I felt I should join my husband, John, in his work in Spain. However, there were challenges being in the same area where John had served with Ruth. Looking back, I think going to a third country in the first place would have been a better idea. John's brother Andy and his wife Carol are serving in Peru now. Carol wants to reopen the MK school and needs teachers. I taught all ages of missionary kids in Japan and am excited about teaching again. Another reason in our changing fields is monthly support. Our support has decreased due to churches losing members and aging individual supporters. The requirements for Peru are about $1,000 less per month than for Spain. These factors, along with prayer and counsel, have helped us to see God's leading us to Peru. We have the blessing of our home church, Northland Community Church, and Pastor David Smith, as well as the support of the ABWE Spain and Peru teams. Our family took a survey trip to Peru in August and are excited to return to serve there. Peru is a land of great beauty and much diversity. With towering mountains and coastal plains, with vast deserts and dense rainforests teeming with plants and animals, with hundreds of riverways and great canyons deeper than the U.S. Grand Canyon. The third largest country in South America after Brazil and Argentina, Peru is about the size of Alaska. In the north, Peru nearly touches the equator. Ecuador, Colombia, Brazil, Bolivia, and Chile border the country. Peru is divided into three areas, the Andes Mountains, the Pacific Coast, and the Amazon River Basin. The Andes are the longest mountain chain in the world, stretching about 4,500 miles down South America. They form the backbone of the country and have cold temperatures. In the highlands, llamas are still used as pack animals. The Pacific Coast is one of the driest in the world and has a milder climate. Nearly half the population lives near the capital, Lima, on the Pacific. The Amazon River Basin, which covers two-thirds of the nation's land, is hot and humid year-round. Eight feet long paiche fish, which make good eating, majestic jaguars, monkeys, frogs, and 1,800 species of birds thrive in the rainforest. The Incan Empire ruled in Peru for about 300 years, building great palaces, temples, and cities, including the famous tourist attraction Machu Picchu. When the Spanish conquistadors under Francisco Pizarro arrived in 1532, they executed the last Incan emperor and established Lima as the capital. The Spanish ruled about 300 years until Peru became an independent republic in 1821. Unfortunately, the last 200 years have been filled with military coups, dictatorships, and political corruption. Modern Peru retains its Incan character, but Spanish influence can be seen in the magnificent cathedrals, elaborate fiestas, and Spanish language. Peru's 30 million people are mostly indigenous or mestizos, people of mixed Spanish and indigenous ancestry. Some indigenous people in the highlands or jungles still live, as their ancestors have for thousands of years. However, old ways are changing with the rise of a middle class, different roles for women, and better public education, which is free and compulsory for ages six through 16. Transportation and communication are also improving in larger cities. The family remains the most important social group with strong patriarchal leadership. In 2015, the World Bank declared Peru's economy to be the, one of the best in Latin America but some 30% still live below the poverty line. Fishing in the ocean and numerous rivers, mining for silver, copper, and oil, and tourism with three million annual visitors are the major industries. Peru is the eighth largest fruit and vegetable producer in the world. Exotic fruits such as cacao fruit, kamu kamu, lucuma, and mango are cultivated along with potatoes, corn, asparagus, cucumbers, and grapes. Many Peruvians work hard just to survive, but religious and ethnic festivals are a time to relax and enjoy life. Carnival is celebrated in the spring, and Independence Days are July 28th through 29th. 
In addition, most communities have their own saint or patron with yearly festivals involving dancing and colorful costumes, local food, market stalls, and often fireworks. Other leisure activities include football or soccer, the favorite sport, as well as volleyball, basketball, and baseball. Many enjoy hiking and mountaineering or swimming and surfing at the beach. After a hard day's work, people relax at home with family or go out with friends for a meal in a cafe. Many Peruvian dishes are spicy, such as ceviche, marinated raw white fish cooked in lime juice with peppers and onions. Street vendors and restaurants serve various seafood dishes, roast guinea pig, Chinese fried rice, guanes, fish or chicken steamed with rice or yuca in a bamboo leaf, tamales, and John's favorite, lomo saltado. As in most of Latin America, Roman Catholicism is the primary religion with 81% professing to be Catholic. Most have only nominal allegiance to the church with about 15% attending weekly mass. About 12% of the people are evangelicals. The ABWE Peru team is composed of 22 missionaries working in four areas. Lima, the capital, Chiclayo in the northwest, Iquitos, a city in the jungle, and Arequipa in the south. The focus has been evangelism, discipleship, church planting, and leadership training. In order to continue to train and grow pastors and leaders, ABWE missionaries established Bible Institutes. The Bible Institute in Iquitos was founded in 1948 and currently offers 78 classes for a four-year degree, including specialized classes for music, youth and children's ministries, and correspondence courses. Right now, there's a need for teachers at the Bible Institute, and I will be involved in teaching. I will be working with Carol Patton, teaching MKs and Peruvian children. We also desire to partner with Peruvian pastors, wives, and lay leaders to help strengthen and grow churches. The Calvario Church was established in the 60s, and the core families are still faithful. One such family is the Valdivia family. I have known them for about 50 years. We were able to visit with them during our survey trip in August. The Valdivias are believers and Miguel was a Bible Institute graduate. Two of the Valdivia sisters, Rocio and Sharon, are still faithful members at Calvario. The church has a new large building that is used for multi-church events. However, they are without a pastor now and need direction for growth. Another church is Belen Templo. They have a great youth group with teens who are excited about growing in the Lord and reaching out to others. Pastor Josue Kanakiti's church in Naota, a city upriver from Iquitos, is working on two new church plants. Numerous villages up and down the river have small churches as well. Most Peruvian pastors work full time to support their families, so they need help with teaching and preaching responsibilities and with organizing special events, outreaches or projects in their churches. A great need also exists to encourage leaders to faithfully stay the course and continue sound biblical teaching. We plan to serve in Iquitos doing evangelism and discipleship, preaching, teaching and training leaders, helping and encouraging pastors and lay leaders in church growth and strengthening. Thank you for your continued prayers as we travel in the states and transition to Peru. As a teen, I claimed Isaiah 6 8 as my life verse. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. God sent me as a single to Japan, with John to Spain, and now our family to Peru for a new chapter in ministry. Thank you for your part in helping us go and make disciples. Good evening. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Oh, pretty good. <laughs> Con banwa. Oh, there we got one of them anyway. Okay, that, that's all the languages I know, sorry. So, uh, it's good to be here tonight and to be able to share with you. It's nice to come to a church and see lots of faces I recognize and I know, and I can call them by name too, and they call me by name, and so that's uh, a special blessing to be here tonight for that. We are excited about going to Peru. We are in Rochester, traveling to five churches here in New York for the next three weeks. And then we'll be going back to Michigan where we have a small house. 
and we will be leaving for Peru on April 14th. So that's coming up very quickly. Please pray that we will get all of our stuff ready on time. The packing is limited to go to Iquitos. So that's going to be hard for us. If you saw how many boxes and bags and things we brought into my parents' house last night, you would understand that. So pray that we'll have wisdom for the most important things to take. We have to take school books. We have to take clothes and um, you know, just other things. So uh, that's what we're, we're working on right now. We are very thankful that during our uh, time that we've been in the States, the last uh, seven, eight months, that God has brought in about half of the support that we need. We still need another um, about $250 a month support. The trend in missions nowadays is actually moving toward having more individuals, supporters, having about 50% of your support from churches and then about 50% from individuals. And so we have been visiting our churches the last um, several months and we've been just giving a challenge. If God would lay this on your heart, that you would like to become an individual supporter and give. If we had one individual from each of our supporting churches, of 26 churches, that would give $20 a month to help us in our ministry, that would take care of all that we, we need. Okay, that's what we had when we started out. We have about half of that now. And so if God would put this on your heart, come and talk to us at the table in the back at the end, and we can get you um, set up with that, and we appreciate your part in our ministry. When I went to Peru for the first and only time I've been there, all of two weeks that I was there, I got to meet many of John's old friends because he grew up there. And they were all glad to see me and Julie and Jessica, our girls. It was funny because when we would go places and meet people that were his friends from when he was a kid, they would all call him Juanito. If you know Spanish, some couple laughs there. If you know Spanish, that means little Johnny. Okay, well... It's not usually how I think of my husband, but anyway, so he was Juanito, and that was fun to hear. One such lady that called him Juanito was Rocio, and Rocio is just a really neat lady. She and her family, they were in the video there, the picture from, like, I don't know, 60s, maybe 70s on there, the old one that you saw. That was her family when she was a child. She invited us over for lunch. She wanted us to come to her house. She was so excited to meet John's family, and so... We went there. It was chilly, actually. Usually it's always hot there, but it was a little bit chilly. It was pouring rain that day. We went way out into the country, away from the city of Iquitos, and she was so excited to see us. She just gave us a great bit, you know, kiss and um, hugs and just welcoming us to her house. And she said, mi casa es su casa. My house is your house. And so I'm standing there, I'm a little bit wet, and I'm kind of looking around at her house. And I notice that it has a, a corrugated tin roof, and we're standing in her kitchen, but it's outside. There's a picnic table. She has some bricks with just a grate on top of it to cook on, which she was grilling the chicken and the bananas on that. Her kitchen sink is outside in this little lean-to area. Now, it is pretty much always hot there, so it's not like cooking outside in Rochester, New York. That would be a little different, but... Went inside the house, dirt floor, and uh, there was indoor plumbing, so that was something that had been added recently, but very small bath. And we went up a rickety set of stairs, upstairs to her bedroom. Bedroom was barely bigger than her house, and it had a bed in it, and it had a mosquito net all around it, draped, you know, all around the um, bed. The windows, well, there weren't windows, it was just wide open. So if it was raining, such as it was that day, you could just roll down some clear plastic sheets, no screens, no windows, and that's her bedroom. And I'm, I'm looking at all this, and I'm thinking, wow, mi casa es su casa? Um, Lord, I'm not sure if I could do that, actually. But I'm looking at Rocio, and she is radiating the joy of the Lord, so happy to share what she has us. And I was convicted. Wow, Wendy, you, you're not always so hospitable and willing to share what you have with others. And you're not always content with the things that you have, which is way more than what she has. And so it was also interesting, the perspective, because my daughters went upstairs with me to the room and they saw the mosquito net and they were like, wow, princess bed, it's a canopy over it. Cool. You know, and they're all excited about it. 
But it was a good thing um, for me to meet her and to, to realize that we as missionaries, of course, we go and we teach the gospel and we teach things. But the people there have so much that they can teach us too. And so I'd like to become a little bit more like Rocio, radiating the joy of the Lord, just happy, serving him, doing what I can, sharing what I have with others. Hebrews 13, 5 says, be content with such things as ye have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And that's been true when I was in Japan. God was with me there and in Spain, and God's going to continue to be with us as we go to Peru. Rocio was um, a great teacher for me, and I'm thankful for her example of being content and how she was joyful in the Lord. Now, I did tell you things about her house, and everything I said about her house was true. However, toward the end of our time there, after we were done eating, we were sitting around talking, I did see her plug in her smartphone. So I was a little bit not sure how that fit in with, you know, the dirt floors and everything. But um, anyway, I'm thankful for her and her example to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. What time do I have to? Okay. okay. <laughs> There's a passage of scripture that kept going through my mind uh, when we were on our survey trip, and I wanted to share that with you today. Um, those of you who have your Bibles, if not, you can just listen, that's fine. In uh, John chapter 4, I'm going to just take a look at a few verses there. John chapter 4, verses 35, and I'll read the first part of verse 36. John 4, 35 says, Say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto eternal life. I'm sure pastor and uh, Sunday school teachers and others that have taught scripture, maybe if you've uh, led a Bible study in your home, can say this too. Sometimes, especially those of us who grew up in the church, when we listen to a passage of scripture or reading a passage of scripture, sometimes our minds are just closed off because we say to ourselves, you know, I've already heard that. I've heard so many sermons or, or so many Bible studies on that. And we think that we know what, this, what the passage is saying. So I'm just going to ask if you would just please be open. Maybe God can speak to you through this passage in a different way that you've never seen before. So I, I trust that tonight that you'll be able to do that. We see in verse 35, Jesus is saying that witnessing is like planting seed. And even though some of the hearers there, because some could have been fishermen, maybe they were shopkeepers, maybe they worked for the local government, everyone was familiar with farming because they were surrounded by it everywhere they went. If they walked outside their town, they were familiar with that. The fields were ready for harvest, are like people ready to respond to the gospel and be saved. So he's putting those things together. And Jesus did that many times, something that they were used to in their life, and then he would had a connection with a spiritual uh, lesson. It has to do with reaching the lost. The disciples probably thought it would take quite a while for these uh, Samaritans to respond to this new message. We know their background. They had different beliefs and different ways of thinking and their practices. But Jesus says, open your eyes, look at the fields. The people were ready to listen to the gospel and were ready to respond. So as we go to this passage, it's not just me, you know, uh, it's not me, it's not Wendy, we're going out to people that have, have, might not have heard the gospel before or maybe they haven't heard it very much and, and giving them the opportunity to respond. We need to think about in our own circles too. And, and as our country is going, I think we're going to see this more and more, that this, uh, this passage has to do with us as well. Jesus wanted his disciples to be aware of the situation. So when we're in any given situation, whether we're at home or we're at work or we're in, in school, we need to be aware of what's going on around us. What were the disciples, what were they concerned about? They get into town there and they're starting to get hungry. So what did they do? They were concerned about eating food. So they went to buy some food. It says meat there in the English translation, but uh, there's nothing wrong with food. And we know Jesus, he fed thousands, several occasions. So there's nothing wrong with food, but there's more going on around us than just that, just the immediate. 
the physical. Jesus was interested in reaching these lost people who were ready and eager to be saved. Yes, I'm sure Jesus ate. But he was aware of what's going on around him. And not, we shouldn't let that blind us to the, what's really eternal, what's, what's important. And we see in verse 36, this calling by the Lord to his disciples includes promises of reward. And it's not a reward like they had in the Roman days and in the Greek days and you ran a race and you were just in town and in the city you were just a hero for the day and everywhere you went people wanted to buy you something. Hey, let me buy you a drink. Let me buy you some food. The next day no one knew who you were because there was another hero. And that laurel that you had there, that thing that you wore, it started to get old and started to wither and started to get dry. No one cared about you anymore. It's not that. It's not that that we're working for. The fruit or harvest involves eternal joy. And that's what it says. It says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto eternal life. Eternal life. These are eternal things. These are things that are going to last. So we need to think about that in our own lives. I was, uh, the year my parents arrived on the mission field, they had just finished language school in Costa Rica. And so when uh, my parents uh, got off the plane, of course, it's the old way, you know, where you go down the steps. When they came down, mom was pregnant with me. And I imagine they must have arrived in the summertime. And in November of 1963, I was born in the Clinica Stal. It's an Adventist hospital overlooking the Amazon River. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, she said that everyone was sad because John F. Kennedy had just been assassinated. And she was happy because I was born. And notice my first name is John. There were a lot of Johns that were, you know, people named John during that time because he was a popular, popular president. But uh, it's interesting that where the, the hospital is located, uh, you have the uh, road that goes from the city of Iquitos to the Nanai River. There's a road in front of the hospital. So if you were going to go from Iquitos to the hospital, you have to take that road. But if you go down the bank, that's where my dad would keep his speedboat. And uh, one of the first ministries he had was in the town of Requena. And that was where my, br my brother Tom was born. So Andy, my oldest brother, was born in the United States, I believe in New York. And uh, then I was born in Iquitos, and then my brother was born in Requena. And, they were, they, and he wasn't born in the hospital. There was a hospital there, but you really didn't want to go there because you would come out worse than when you went in. So he was born in our house, and my dad was a typical, very nervous father. And he was practicing when, when the baby comes out, you know, you have to kind of, there's this liquid in their mouth, you kind of have to suck it out. I mean, I, we might have nurses or doctors out there, you know more about this, but, but uh, that you have to suck it out so that the child, the, the, the baby can breathe. So he was practicing, he had this little, he had some water and he was practicing with this little suction thing. Well, Tom was born, and guess what he did? He squeezed that thing and it had water in it because he was practicing, he forgot to empty it. So uh, my brother Tom was gagging, and so we always said, well, T Tom, that's why you're always strong, you know, you're the stronger of the boys. He's also happened to be the one that never had any new clothes. My mom would buy tough skins over at Sears and Roebuck, and it started with Andy. Mine were slightly used, and Tom, they all, you know, had holes in them, but he never had new clothes, the poor guy. But uh, it was a place where we were constantly, uh, when my when my parents moved into town, they noticed there was this big, huge bridge. The Requena was had two parts, and basically it was divided by a river. And when they arrived, the river was very, very narrow and very low. And there was this big, huge bridge in the middle of town to connect the two sides. And my dad says, well, what's the bridge for? Well, the, the river comes up and down, and it's uh, so that people can get across from one side of town to the other. But it didn't go all the way across. There was this big gap in the middle, and then they just had these wood planks that went across. He says, well, why doesn't it go all the way across? Well, you got to have the, you got to have the big boats that go through the middle. Sure enough, the river would come up. And we had really high, uh, some years when the river would come up very high, it would actually flood our church. And so we had to meet in homes, and basic, I remember getting in a canoe and going down Main Street, getting up to the missionary lady's house and basically just knock on the door, just step right out of the canoe into her house when the, when the river was up high. And you had all these things that would happen. We had a lot of snakes. My uh, neighbor would get snakes where he was out in the jungle. 
he'd put them in a burlap sack and he said hey john call me johnny well they want to know what juanito is in in english so it was johnny hey johnny come over here we're going to take it over to la normal which was a university out in the middle of the jungle and so he had he would grab the head inside the burlap sack and i would hold the body and we had someone else grab the tail and we'd take it over there and you know they would mount it and put it in their museum and all so forth but there were a lot of there were a lot of snake bite victims and usually what people would do is when they got bit um, they would just wait to see what happened and as it got worse they would they would go to the doctor and he was an alcoholic the, the doctor in town was an alcoholic and if you could get him where he wasn't drinking that he could treat you well but uh, usually that didn't help and then they go to the witch doctor and then when that didn't help then they would come to the missionary so these people were very sick and sometimes my dad would have to take them to, to uh, Iquitos by, by boat. And sometimes they made it and sometimes they did not. So it's a very fa- sad situation. I remember uh, near the end of my uh, parents' time there in Requena, my dad had, had, uh, had read that there was a, a missionary doctor in Ecuador, I believe it was, that had done some tests that if you gave electric shocks to these uh, snake bite victims, that it would neutralize. I don't know if it's neutralized the poison or the effect it had on the body. So he decided to use that. So a man came to him and said, oh, missionary, I'm really, you know, I got bit on the leg here. And I remember this because I was there. And he got bit on the leg and he had waited a while and it was, you know, getting festering and it was swollen. And so my dad, we went out back where we had our generator. We had to put it in a, you know, keep it locked up. So he opened up the gate and that's back when you had to put the rope on and, and start it. And he says, well, what I do? Well, touch it with, so my dad got the spark plug exposed. Well, touch it with your finger. Boom! And so it knocked him down, and it, the generator went off, and, and he, he asked the guy, um, do you feel any better? Oh, no, it still, it still hurts. Well, let's get that thing going again. So, boom, get it up. Now what I do? Well, you know where it bit you? You need to put that up against the spark plug. I don't know if I want to do this, but the missionary told me, so I'm going to do it. So he did. He went over there and bam And just immediately, a lot of the pain was gone. So anyways, that was life. Uh, by the way, I also wanted to mention uh, what, yeah, I also wanted to mention the one picture of me. Uh, I'm speaking in chapel, the blue shirt on, in the background, with green, uh, kind of a bluish green uh, walls, was the, uh, is the Bible Institute where I'll be teaching. And the top floor is where the missionaries would stay that are in, were in town. It's like a guest house. And I remember specifically that building because there are some bathrooms on both sides. It's like a U-shape, and there's a bathroom on each side. And when you would go into the bathroom, you'd have to look down the toilet to make sure there were no eels that would, because they worked their ways up. And you'd always look there, and whatever you had to do, you had to do quickly. Um, at, I'm not exaggerating. I saw, I found several eels there. But uh, that was life. Well, when, when they were working in Requena as a boy, as a five-year-old boy, the Sunday school teacher asked who wanted to be saved, and I wanted to be saved, and I prayed the prayer. I, I, you know, I prayed the prayer. I uh, put my hand up, and I always said that was when I was saved. You know, if you ask me, you know, when were you saved or were you saved? I always said that was when I was saved. But it wasn't until we were in, I was in junior high. We were on furlough in a church in Ohio, and the pastor was preaching a fire and brimstone uh, sermon, and he said, if you left this church tonight and you walked outside there and walked across the street and a car ran over you, killed you instantly, you know if you'd go to heaven. And I wasn't so sure because I knew how I'd live my life. And I, I prayed. I said, God, if I'm not saved, I want you to save me right now. And God did change me. I wasn't, it wasn't all instant, but there was a lot of changes, and I wanted to be baptized. So I was baptized. There were three changes that occurred at that time. One is, I had had devotions before, every day, okay? Because that's what Christians do. But I wanted to have devotions. I had gone to church, but I wanted to go to church. I wanted to be with God's people. I wanted to know his word and the conviction of sin. And so God was starting with me. But at that time, there were two things I did not want to be. I didn't want to be a missionary. Remember those furloughs? 
where I wanted to be outside playing soccer and I had to be dressed up in a suit and tie, sitting at the dining room table after meal, listening to the adults talk, and et cetera and so forth. And uh, I just, it was, yeah, it was, it was hard. But anyways, I didn't want to be a missionary and have to raise all that support and everything, you know. And I didn't want to be a pastor. You go, why didn't you want to be a pastor? Well, I knew pastor's kids. I didn't want my kids to end up like that. So, and, and the pastors here probably said, yeah, but what about those missionary kids? So, anyways, uh, some of the ones I knew, the pastor's kids were pretty, were rascals. I'm thinking of more of the guys, but they're, they're a bunch of rascals, but they probably thought the same of me. But anyways, but God changed my, my thinking on that. Um, one summer I was... Uh, after I graduated from high school, I went to college in the States, and one summer I had to work in college and during the summers, and uh, God began work, working on my heart, and I prayed. I, I said, God, I'll do anything you want me to do, go anywhere you want me to go, and I didn't know what that meant at the time, and I had a friend that was in the Philippines that same summer, and he gave his report at chapel, and I was really pumped. I said, man, this is great. I said, I would love to go back to Peru and show the people there what God can do in a young man's life. I want to serve there. You know, you're an MK, you just have to be there. But I wanted to be there. I wanted to serve. And uh, I said, but I don't have any money. He said, well, if God wants you to be there, he'll provide. And so God provided. It's a long story. I don't have time to share with you everything. But God provided more than enough. And so I went to Peru on summer missions. And we were, um, we were a group of, I believe, seven guys and girls and uh, we served in the jungle, and then they sent us over to the coast for two weeks at the end of our stay. And uh, we were in Lima for a while, and then they t took us to Ica. And this is a four-hour drive on the Pan American Highway. And uh, when we get, came into town, I remember Andy Lard saying, you see that building over there, which was the hospital? He says, don't go in there, because if you go in there, you'll come back out in a black box. And I thought, well, I will not get close to that. So anyways, during, my, during our time, in Ica, I began to develop some uh, pains and so forth, and it was their holiday, their Independence Day, so everything was closed. So we called the local doctor, and he came and he saw me, and I said, hey, I said, doctor, I think I've got appendicitis. I, said, I had this when I was younger, and I had antibiotics, and it went away. He said, and so he poked, and he said, well, I don't, he says, you don't have appendicitis because you'd either be in intense pain by now, or you'd be dead. And he said, you're neither. I said, well, okay, I can't argue with you. You're the doctor. So but actually, of course, he charged me. But that night, actually, my appendix had ruptured, okay? And it was, it, was such a, it was such a jolt for me. Basically, I just was out, okay? As soon as it ruptured, boom, I didn't wake up till the next morning. Well, we were heading back to Lima anyways, and so they put a, uh, a uh, mattress in the back of the van on, on the Pan American. It was a four-hour drive to Lima, and I was asking the team for pain medicine. You know, do you have any pain medicine? I'll take anything you have. I don't care what it's for. So we got there, and they called a, a Christian doctor, but she was gone. She was gone on vacation because it was the holiday. So they took me to the hospital, and the doctor came in, and he poked and asked me questions. He said, you need to be operating on right now, John. So they called my parents in the jungle, and they said, what do we do? Well, get a second and third opinion, and if he needs surgery, have Dr. Kiapa do it. So... Two other doctors came in, did the same thing. A tall doctor came in, you need to be operated on. A short doctor came in, you need to be operated on. I thought, you know, there's something common here. I need to be operated on. So they got me ready with an uh, IV bottle, and uh, they called Dr. Kiapa. He says, oh, yes, I recognize that family operated on his brother years ago. I'll do it, but I don't work at that hospital where he is. You have to take him over to the Anglo-Americano. Well, we're good missionaries. You don't want to waste money. You don't go in an ambulance, go in a missionary's car. This is like Columbo's old Volvo, you know, clunker. And we get in there, and I'm holding the IV bottle, and he's ripping through town. And it's like going in Lima, driving in Lima is like the Indianapolis 500 anyways. And he's going through red lights, and get out of the way, this is, a mission. This is an emergency. And he, I hear, heard this putt, 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 and we get to the side of the road, and he goes, I thought I had enough gas. <laughs> don't worry, John, I'll get a taxi. So he got a taxi, flagged down a taxi. I get out, I've got my IV bottle sitting in the front seat. And I thought at the time, this guy's not, we got to, he said, oh yeah, I know where the Anglo Americano is. And I, I thought, this guy hasn't asked me any questions. Like, what's going on here? This is weird. I thought, he, he were, he's a taxi driver in the capital city of Peru. He's probably seen a lot weird, weirder things than this. So get me in there, put my stuff in the room. 
and wheel me into the these uh, room to do surgery. And uh, they strap you down. You're not going anywhere. So they strap me down. I'm not moving. And this guy with a big beard looks down at me. And I, I, I say this, his teeth like were glistening in the lights. And he looked down. He looked like a butcher, you know. Like you, you just imagine the butcher like a uh, fiddler on the roof or something. And he looks down. And he goes, hi, gringo. And I thought, oh, mother, if you ever made a mistake, this is not the time to do it. Like, this guy's going to slice me up. Well, he was not the surgeon, okay? The Thotkiapu was very refined. He was the anesthesiologist, which, of course, is very important, but at least he didn't touch me. <laughs> so I, I woke up, and when I woke up, the doctor said, look, John, you've lost a lot of blood. We had to give you blood transfusions, and I thought, oh, good, good proving blood in me, and it get me stronger. But he said, we couldn't find it. It was just all through your body, so they had to hook me up to two bungee cords hooked to a pump, and every so many seconds it had to pump me out he says now to clean your, your system out because it's throughout your whole, whole body we didn't operate till 24 hours after it ruptured uh, we have to clean you out and there's a medication we're using where it's an experimental here in Peru uh, we're testing on you it's been approved by the American Medical Association but we've never tried it here in Peru so we're going to see how it works on you so I thought oh thank you doctor but I was in the, I was in the hospital a week while I was there, the head of nursing was an American married to a Peruvian, and she, uh, sa- she came to me and she said, John, you know, I've been working at this for quite a while, and she says, when you came in here, we were not sure you are going to make it. You should have made it, but God has spared you for a reason. He's got a purpose. Now, I don't even know if this is a believer, okay? She said, but God has saved your life for a reason. Now, God wasn't finished with me yet. I recovered. I met Ruth, who I ended up marrying. We were married two, uh, on that trip. She was on that trip. We were married uh, two years later. And we were Christian school teachers. And uh, we were in Florida at the time. And uh, we take walks after class. And one day she said, John, what do you want to do? Well, I couldn't, te- we couldn't, the, we, I couldn't teach the rest of my life because I didn't make enough money. But I knew what she said, what she meant. And I said, I want to be a missionary. I, was, I looked around like, I said that. I can't believe I said that. But you have to understand, on Saturdays, I was doing ministry. I was serving as chaplain in the local jail, the Okeechobee County Jail, leading people to the Lord, having Bible studies with these murderers. I mean, they did all kinds of vile things, and they're looking forward to opening up Scripture and learning more. So I began seminary. I finished seminary right before I went to the mission field. While I was raising support to go to Spain, where I worked for 20 years, people would ask me in some of the churches, especially the ones in New York that knew my parents and knew me as a child, would say, well, John, why aren't you going to Peru? <clears throat> and my answer was, well, I don't feel called to go to Peru. But if and when I do, I'll go. And that's what I'm doing now. Let's get back to you. You go, well, this is really great, John. You know, all the stuff you've said, it's nice, but what does that have to do with me? Each of us, not all of us can get on a plane and go overseas. We have that opportunity. We have that privilege to do that. God has put each of us in this room, each of us have a sphere of influence. God has put some people in your lives that I will never see, pastor will never see, leaders of this church will never see, but God has put people in your life, and you can think of that right now, or God will work on your heart throughout the week, He has put people in your life that you need to reach out to with the gospel. And I know sometimes we're afraid, like, well, I wonder what they're going to say. I wonder what they're going to think. We don't know what they're going to think. We don't know what they're thinking. But as we saw in this passage, open your eyes, look at the fields. We need to be aware of the situation. We need to be aware of what's going on around us. And that's where we fit in to this passage. That's where we fit into this message. We each have our sphere of influence, and God has put you in a particular place to be able to reach out to other people with the gospel. So that's what I want to encourage you with. We thank you for your prayers. We have new uh, prayer cards out there if you'd like to pick one up, and we thank you so much for this opportunity to share. Thanks, Pastor.